Now, Matt said I'm the uh, like famous business leader at Jeepers. That's not the case. Here's the real reason I'm here. Um, I am working at Crossroads. I've been on the staff for about four years. And before that, I spent 20 years in the banking industry. Now, the topic I'm talking to is how to be entrepreneurial in a traditional culture. Can you think of two industries that are more risk averse and resistant to change than banking or churches? I mean, come on. That's why I'm here today. I mean, you know, they were hard up. They had to find somebody. Who could we get to talk to this? So there's been a lot written in traditional organizations and a lot tried about how to structure yourself to be more entrepreneurial. And it really has had very limited success. Babson College in Boston's done a lot of work on this. They actually set up an entrepreneurial experience lab to study how do you create entrepreneurial spirit and entrepreneurs within a traditional company. Because think about it, duh, every leader of a company would love to harness, right, the good ideas and the energy and the passion of their employee base. So, here's what they found. They found that traditional organizations cannot structure themselves into being entrepreneurial. They just can't. Because, here's why. Organizations aren't entrepreneurial. People are. Now, you probably are familiar with the statistic. Um, Gallup did a poll back in, I think, 2011, when they found that, um, gosh, 71% of American workers are either not engaged or actively disengaged with their work. Now, what Babson found was that entrepreneurial employees within traditional organizations are the outliers there. They're not in that 71%. They actually are passionate about what they're doing. They're connected deeply to their work. They're flourishing among other entrepreneurial employees. And they are actually excited about the resources available to them within a traditional organization and about how they can combine those resources to do and create new and innovative things. Now, that's my job today, I think, is if you are here and you have, you want to innovate, you've got great ideas, and you're working in a traditional culture, my job is to give you some hope in these 20 minutes. Because it can happen. I've seen and I have done lots of new things in some of the malls change-resistant industries that exist. So the question is, not everybody is gifted in this. Not everybody is an entrepreneur. But if you are an entrepreneur, you can be an entrepreneur in any role that you're in. A title, a position, where you are in the organization does not give you entrepreneurial capabilities. Actually, it's not that at all. It's your mindset. It's how you think about things. And most important, just like what Todd said, it's the passion. It's the desire. At Crossroads, we call it the burn. It's, it's how do you burn? How do you burn? And it's that that makes you an entrepreneur. And then you can do things, whether that's a new product or a new system or a new work process, you can actually apply that mindset in any place that you're at. So there is hope. But how do you do it? And does God have anything to say about it? We've talked a lot about how God has designed us, and we are designed to be creative like him. And who's to say that God, for those of you who are in traditional organizations, who's to say that God hasn't placed you there exactly to be where you are? In fact, that calling on your life may actually be a way that he wants to get his purposes done where you are, 
It might be to open a whole new service to a group of people that have never been served. It might be to reach out one person. It might be in the team that you're building. But he may actually be in that calling and exactly in the place that you are. Now, if you are an innovator and you are in a traditional organization, you actually have a title. So let me give you your title. You're called an inside entrepreneur. Do we have any here, inside entrepreneurs? Do you have some? We got a few, yes, all right. How do you fulfill your calling? I can just share with you what my experience has been. So I've got five things. But before I do that, I do want to share with you my really favorite definition of what an entrepreneur is. This is from Harvard Business School guy. His name's Howard Stevenson, and he says, entrepreneurship is the pursuit of an opportunity without regard to the resources currently controlled. So, that means you're inside an organization, you have a really good idea, you have a burn around it, you want to do it, and you don't have any idea how. How am I going to make this happen? Is there even a possibility to make it happen? Well, you know, sometimes that's the way God gets you exactly where he wants you. Because when you're not sure how, that's the time when you need to depend on him. And he tends to draw us to himself in exactly that way. We're afraid. We feel like it's hopeless. And he finds ways in that feeling to actually draw you closer by helping you realize you need to trust him and you need to depend on him. In fact, if you need some encouragement that you're not alone in this process... Go to chapter 11 in Hebrews in the book of the Bible, and you will find a whole lot of folks that are called God's heroes. And you know why they're commended? They're commended actually because they had faith. They took a step out when they weren't sure where they were going or where God was leading them or for what purpose they were being called. So... Inside Entrepreneur, let me give you five things that I have learned from my own experience. This is how you can thrive in a traditional organization. First is knowledge. Think about it. I invest in Chris Sutton's business. I'm one of his investors. And part of the reason I have confidence in Chris and in Noble is because he knows his market, he knows his business, he knows the landscape, he knows the pricing pressures, he understands the landscape he's working in. Well, if you're in a traditional organization, you need that same kind of knowledge. You need it about your own organization. You need to understand the needs, you need to understand the pressure points, you need to understand the numbers, you need to understand your business. There's one other thing, though, if you're inside an organization that startup entrepreneurs don't deal with, and that is you need to understand where the leadership is going. Because you can have the best idea, and if it doesn't meet a need, if it doesn't open a new market, if it doesn't relieve a pressure point that that business is experiencing, then you're not going to be aligned with where the leadership wants to go. So know your business, know where your leaders are heading, and then look for opportunities to solve something that is a pressure point for the business. I actually uh, work for uh, U.S. Bank, as I told you, and um, I was there. I got a chance to innovate when we had a CEO who was a retail guy, meaning he was very aggressive about pursuing new customers, really aggressive about it. And I was head of the distribution system for the bank, so I ran that business. And it's overriding factor in the banking business that customers, at least at the time when I was there, the customers choose a bank based on convenience to their home or to their work. So 
my CEO wants to drive the whole organization to obviously get new customers and new markets. I was running the distribution system, so I could open more locations and obviously get more customers. The problem is it's very expensive. So I could open a new bank in Cincinnati or Milwaukee or St. Louis, and it might cost me a million and a half, two and a half million, somewhere in that range. As we went into Seattle or San Francisco or Los Angeles, we were looking at price tags, five, six, seven million dollars just to open. And the return on that investment sometimes took the company like five years or more, which is not real attractive. So I'm thinking, what if, just what if, we could possibly take banks and put them inside companies? And then the cost to us to do it would basically be the cost of our operation. We could do it for maybe $250,000 or $300,000. What if? Now, the how this came about was exactly related to being externally focused. So I'm in Cincinnati running this business, and Procter & Gamble actually puts out an RFP. Now, this is back in 1995. If you can believe it, Procter actually at that time had offices in each of their locations where they gave out cash to their employees to reimburse them for like products that they might buy, competitor products that they used in the research or to reimburse them for travel. Hard to believe, but that did happen. And they put out an RFP looking for an external supplier who could actually provide the service still, but it wouldn't be at a cost to Procter, right? It's called outsourcing. Well, duh, I'm a banker. I'm thinking, who wouldn't want access to Procter & Gamble employees for their business? My. I mean, I knew it would change the whole way, the business model we had for how we did banking. You know, we'd have to change lots of things. But my gosh, what an opportunity. So duh, respond to the proposal. We got the business. U.S. Bank got that business. I found out much later that actually nobody else even saw the opportunity. We didn't have any competition. Being externally focused means that you are looking out of your organization. There is a gravitational pull inside a company, especially in traditional organizations, to stay looking within all the time. It just, it just, you know, this is not about being, you know, filling up an employee suggestion box about how to improve problems in the company. I mean, this is actually extending yourself. It's, it's counterintuitive, but the way you make an impact inside an organization by changing and making things happen is by keeping your attention outside the organization. So following trends, reading books, networking with people in other industries, looking at what they're doing. And then I have this friend who actually, this is her business. She's with the Garage Group. I think she's probably here. And she talks about this process called connecting the dots. That when you're inside, you know your business well, you're looking outside at the trends and that combination of things gives a creative spark that creates a possibility and an opportunity that other people don't see. Now, end of that story with the bank is that I actually had lunch a couple weeks ago with the executive who now runs that business at the bank. And from that little five or six locations inside of Proctor back in 1995, U.S. Bank now has 900 locations in all kinds of companies across the country, and that business, I think this year is going to do about 100 million. All because looking for opportunity. Desire. Third thing is desire. This is the burn. You got to have a passion for what you do. It can't be just one more idea added to the burden of all the other things you're doing. CityLink for Crossroads, this is evidence of what a burn looks like. Brian talked about it yesterday. Remember? Ten years. It took us ten years. Now, there's a picture of CityLink. We won't talk about all the resistance. But this changed the business model for how social service agencies deliver services. This was a disruptive innovation in the social service space. Because the model was, 
independent agencies, right? Delivering service to the clients, the working poor, in usually kind of run-down, tired-looking office space, where the representative for the agency was really trying to look for ways to make sure they weren't taken advantage of when they were serving a client. And all of a sudden, CityLink comes into play, and you have a first-class facility, and we bring all these social service providers actually together in one place where we partner together with professionals and trained volunteers to actually work together to serve the client. And that was a game changer. That is a game changer. And as Brian mentioned yesterday, we are now getting recognition, meaning CityLink is getting recognition, for creating a new model for how to serve. There is nothing, there is nothing that could have kept us on course to do that, except we had a burning desire to serve the poor in this city. And the community at Crossroads, our leadership, everybody had that burning desire. And we stayed the course, we found a way to raise the money, and we became the volunteers actually providing the service. So desire drives. Fourth thing, risk, career, suicide. I'm exaggerating a little bit. But within a traditional organization, and you're entrepreneurial, you have different kinds of risks than if you're a startup. A startup obviously risks their time, they risk their own money, and friends' money, and family's money, right? They also have opportunity costs because they're absorbed in an idea and they're missing all other kinds of opportunities. For an inside entrepreneur, the risks are different. They're all relational. It's relational capital. It's what happens to my standing in the company. What happens to my reputation? Could I lose my job if my idea doesn't work? And those networks, those relationships that you build within the organization that allows you to build support to actually get the, your idea created becomes the absolutely most important thing. So, back to the bank story. I needed construction guys who could redesign a bank that instead of it being 5,000 square feet, it could do all the same things in 250 square feet. In a closet, basically. I had needed my purchasing guys to come up with new equipment because you needed to now have banker and teller functions all in one piece of equipment because we didn't have space for multiples. I needed human resource partners because the job we were creating in the person who was going to be in that space providing service it was very different. They were teller and banker and leader, and they had all kinds of different functions. They needed to be paid differently. They needed a different job description. They needed to be incented differently. And finally, I needed operation and compliance support because I'm in a really risk-averse industry where compliance is really important, and we needed to make sure that we could have the operating procedures that protected the bank systems and our customers' assets, and at the same time, fulfill practice procedures. So those partnerships, that network, they could either fuel my idea, or they could destroy it. And it's that relational capital that becomes really important if you're going to start something new inside. Last point, act. In the entrepreneur world, in the startup world, there's an act, learn, build cycle, right? Act, learn, build. It's proven, safe recipe. If you want to have success, you've got to act, you learn, you build. In the startup world, there's a discipline that venture capitalists create by their own cycles of funding, right? As you're acting, learning, building, you're either getting resources or not. In the internal, inside entrepreneur world, it's those networks it's those relationships inside the company that will either destroy or fuel your idea. And that will happen based on if you can get consistently improved results as you're continuing to act, learn, and build. Now... 
the Apostle Paul was actually a really aggressive entrepreneur. He started new church communities. He had a burn. He had absolute burn and passion to share the good news of Jesus with people who didn't even know he had. And he met a ton of resistance. He got resistance both from within his own community because they were all Jewish. And what's Paul doing going out to people who aren't Jewish? He also got resistance from the world that he was trying to share the good news with. Now, he had a message, and this is what I want to leave with you today. He had a message to these new communities that he started. And this one came from a church in a marketplace called Ephesus. It was a vital business place, and he had started a church there. And he's writing to them, and he's saying, I urge you to walk in a manner Worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility. So all you inside entrepreneurs, you've been called where you are for a reason and a purpose. And I urge you with Paul to walk in a manner worthy of that calling with humility in the place that you are. And keep walking. Keep walking. Thank you. 